So this morning we're talking about giving. I should say we're turning, we're going to, we're out of the passages that we sort of are looking at. We're looking at Mark 5. We'll start in Mark 5 and then we'll be going to 2 Corinthians 8. So as we know each week there's a variety of passages. Those are the ones that we are looking at this morning. Mark 5, yep. Yeah. And then later on it will be, whatever I said, 2 Corinthians 8. So, we're talking about giving. And the question is, is giving, giving enough? Or maybe that's the title, however you want to say it. I think in this world, everyone at one way, in one way or another, or at one stage in their life or another, is a selfish person. It doesn't matter how much money we have or don't have, we can all be selfish. We frame our lives around how something affects me. Whether you think of yourself as a selfish person or not, you just think about how we frame things in our life. Whether it be politics, whether it be um, religion, whether it be our money, whatever it might be, we think, how would this affect me? That's almost the first thing we think of. And then, how might it affect the world around me? How might it affect others? How might I travel with this? But the first thing, whether we want it to be or not, that pops into our head is, how is this going to affect me? I think oftentimes uh, we, we live in a, a market economy, right? Um, and I think market economies oftentimes encourage this type of selfishness, where there's the, the way that our, our thing is framed is that you have something that you can sell to make a profit for yourself so that you can survive, right? And, or you go and you get a job so that you can have money for yourself so that you can survive. It's always, I'm doing something to help me be able to live and survive, and then, if I have excess, I can give to people, I can do this, I can do that. But the way in which we frame our entire society is built on taking care of our own needs first. And that's just the reality of the world. Whether it be good, whether it be not, it has some positive things to it, and it has some negative things to it. But that's just the way that our society is framed at this time. Um... As I alluded to, you don't have to be rich to be selfish just because of this idea or this way in which we work. Poor people are just as bad with this as, shall we say, rich people. Maybe you don't consider yourself a rich people or a rich person, but uh, thank you. But just if you're not a poor person, you can be just as selfish as if you are a poor person. We know those people, right, who are down and out, who are seemingly uh, are always looking for a handout, right? They're looking for a way to, to beat the system. They're looking for a way to find, uh, you know, if I ask my mom for money and she says no, maybe I'll ask my dad and he'll give me something, right? Whether, whether we're a child, whether we're an adult, there's people who continually frame their life in this way, no matter how much money we have. But I think we all have something to give. And having something to give it puts ourselves in a tiring position. Because there's always something, there's someone who's looking to get. I would surmise, or I would think, not that I've done it, that running a food bank or a thing like this is, is one of the most tiring jobs you could have. Because yes, you're helping people who have needs, but there's always going to be people coming in who feel like they're not getting what they thought they could have got from you. Or they need more than you can give them. Or... Things like that, right? I don't think I've, I've gone through a week where I haven't heard someone come to me asking for, for money or for food or something, and my first answer is always, well, have you checked out Salvation Army? Have you gone to the food bank and seen what they can do for you? And sometimes they say, no, I haven't thought of that. Sometimes they say, yes, I have, and I still need more. And, but more often than not, what I hear is people who have gone there and say, well, they just couldn't help me, or they didn't give me the type of food I wanted, or whatever the answer might be, right? I went to get this help and they didn't give me what, what I thought was I deserved, so I'm going somewhere else. There's always going to be people with need. The question is, how do we deal with people with need? And how do we give in a way that is 
helpful and that is respectful, that is useful in, in leading people and useful for ourselves as well. How do we take our mind out of that frame of first thing about me and then giving out my excess, but also not become a rug that people step on, that they know this is the guy to go to to get a handout, right? I think there's a balance that we need to play with there. And if you think of anyone who's had a, uh, a time where people came to him with need, it was Jesus, right? Jesus wouldn't be able to go through a, a day, maybe not a day, I don't know, but there isn't a single chapter in here where there isn't someone coming in with some kind of need or some kind of need that he's addressing or, or, or dealing with in the Gospels. People were always taking from Jesus. I want us to turn to Mark 5, as I talked about. We're going to start at verse 21, and we're going to look at two different, two different stories that are, in fact, the same story. Often we hear one story, and then we hear the other story, as if they're in isolation from each other. But if we put ourselves in the, in the shoes of Jesus, and we walk through this, just think about um, how it would feel as you, as a human being, being in this situation. Uh, and obviously we'll see things in this text that maybe wouldn't apply to us so because Jesus is doing, doing things that maybe we don't see ourselves doing every day. But just think about yourselves in his shoes as a human and how would this affect you emotionally? How would you process through this? Mark 5.21 starts out, and I'm just going to split things as we go along here. That's a longer text, and just to explain how, where we're going. So verse 21 says, When Jesus had crossed... Again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. He barely got his feet off of the boat, and he already had a crowd ready to see what they could get from him. Verse 22, Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And so he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. So imagine the scene. We have this great crowd coming to Jesus, and one guy gets out first and manages to give his petition, and Jesus says, okay, I'll address this guy's situation first. But I think we can imagine or we can know how it might feel just showing up somewhere and knowing that all these people are here, not because they maybe like my teaching, not because they want something that I can say to them, but because they want something from me. And Jesus used these types of situations all the time to preach to people. He says, I've got a captive audience. I might as well say something good and something positive while they're here because what I'm doing physically, what I'm doing to heal them in this present moment is not as much as what matters is where their heart is at. But in this situation, he's dealing with this, this man who comes. And the other people don't leave saying, oh, he doesn't have time for me. They're pressed in on him. The crowd is following him, wondering, well, when, when he's done with this guy, maybe it's my turn next. Maybe I can get something next. Verse 25 says, There was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. This is one of the other people who was in the crowd that was following him around. And she'd endured much under many physicians. And she'd spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather... She grew worse. So think about her situation. She spent all that she had. She's in a society or in a world where people are willing to take from her, deal with themselves first, even though she's the one that's sick. I don't think we can say that she spent all that she had, and if she just had a little bit more money, then maybe she'd found the right physician who could have healed her. But it seems to me they were just milking her for all that she could get, all they could get. Well, she wants healing, and I don't know how to heal her, but I'll suggest this other thing that maybe she can try, and my great knowledge now, she has to pay for that. Right? She's been cheated by the system around her. Verse 27. So that she'd heard about Jesus, and so she came up behind him in the crowd, and she touched his cloak. And she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately her hemorrhages stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? Imagine what a funny question. 
He's got a crowd of people around him. He says, who touched me? And the disciples are thinking the same thing. Verse 31, his disciples said, you see this crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, who touched me? And he looked all around to see who had done this. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and in trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. See, it's easy to read these two stories that we're dealing with now in isolation from each other. There was this man who had this daughter who needed healing, and there was also this other lady who had these hemorrhages that needed healing, and these are different things that Jesus was dealing with. But he was, in fact, dealing with both of these things at the same time. Preston on all sides, on his way to heal someone else, everyone clamoring for his attention, his attention, and someone else is there who needs help. Have we ever been in this scene? Where we're on our way helping to help someone, we're dealing with a certain situation, and we feel like we don't have anything to give anyone else because we're dealing with this right now, and someone comes in and needs something. And at verse 30, it explains this. It says, the power went out from him. He had nothing left to give. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like the power has gone out of you? You say, I just can't help one more person. I just can't have another phone call or another person knock on the door because there's just too much to deal with right now. This crowd pressing in on me is too great. And I don't know who to help first. I don't know what situation to address. I don't know where to go. But notice Jesus' attitude, what he does. Though he is taxed, he is far less concerned about himself and far more concerned about the people around him. Verse 34, he says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And be healed of your disease. He says, go and be healed. Live in accordance with the healing that you have received. That beautiful word, be. That word is now part of our denominational name. To be in Christ. Is not just a thing that we have, but it's a thing that we be. A thing that we travel with, that we continue on the road of being in Christ. And here he says, be healed. Live in a way in which that you will take full advantage of this healing that you have now received. That this isn't just a thing that I've done for you and now next week you'll come back and see what else I have. Because I've given you something. But take what I've given and travel with it and journey with it and make it part of your story, make it part of your life. That is what we want to do when we heal people or when we help people in any sense, isn't it? We want to break this cycle that maybe people have been in where they just they can't seem to get ahead of their bills or they can't seem to get ahead of the, the empty pantries or they can't seem to get ahead of this addiction they have or whatever it might be. We don't just want to give them a, a piece and say, now I've helped you for a little bit, maybe go to someone else next time until I have more in my bank account to give you. But instead, we want to lead them in a way that we can say, now go and be healed. I've given you something, but it's less about what I have given you and more about what you will receive through it. Go and be healed. He doesn't stand up to the crowd and say, I only have time for one person today. I only have enough power in me for one person today so everyone else can go somewhere else. But instead, he leads in this scenario to the discernment of the Holy Spirit who is in him and with him. That as he guides, as he leads, he knows who to say what to, how to deal with them based on where their heart is at. He helps those whose hearts are ready to receive the help that he is to give. Those who have faith in him and his process. He says, your faith has made you well. It's not me that's made you well. 
I don't have this magic touch or this magic pill that you, I can give you that will make you well, but it's your faith that does that. Your faith in my process. Because the wellness is not in this single thing that he does for this individual. The wellness they receive is in their ability to travel with Jesus. The journey with his way of life, knowing that it leads to continual and further wellness. And then, because we know it's the same story, it continues on. The power has just gone out of him. He has nothing left to give. This situation came up he wasn't expecting to need to deal with, and all of a sudden he's dealing with it. And then he continues on. Verse 35. While he was still speaking, someone came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead, so why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leaders of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Again, he's pointing to this thing, only believe, only have faith. Because they said, well, this immediate situation that we've been dealing with, he can't do anything about that anymore, so he must not have anything to give me. Right? I needed to eat supper yesterday, and so-and-so didn't show up in time to give me food, and so now they might as well not bother coming, because they can't help me with that situation that I was just dealing with. It's over. It's finished. But see, Jesus is not here to deal with this immediate situation, though he does that. He's here for a far greater reason. For people to realize that it's all about belief, it's all about faith, it's all about leading and guiding in this way of healing, this way of wellness, and not just dealing with these individual things along the way. So he says, I have so much more to talk to you about, so much more to teach you, not just about this single thing. And so his way of saying that is, don't have fear, only believe. I'm not going to stop coming just because this, your perception of this thing is now that I can't help you. There's still something I can do. It's almost as if they come and they say, you were so busy helping this woman along the way that now you didn't make it to my place in time. And this happens to us, right? You've heard someone say, I don't need you anymore. Or maybe you've heard, thanks for nothing. Incredible, great thing to say. Someone saying, thanks. Well, not really thank you, right? It happens. But Jesus doesn't stop. Verse 37. It says, he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion. And people were weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and why do you weep? This child is not dead, but is sleeping. And they laughed at him. And then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And he took her by hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And at this they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly ordered them that no one should know this. He told them to give her something to eat. Now that's an interesting, interesting way to end this story, isn't it? That Jesus has just done this miraculous thing for them in a situation that they felt he could do nothing about, so why bother him any longer? And then he says, in a strict way, don't tell anyone this happened. Why might that be? Well, I think if we look at the whole scene, the whole story, and the context of what we're dealing with, he already has enough people following him around. He's already overwhelmed. Already overtaxed. He doesn't need any more people who hear this story and go, oh, that's the guy I go to for this quick fix, for this little miracle that I need, and then continue on my way. Because we all deal with that, right? We help one person, and so-and-so hears from so-and-so that we help that person, and they think, oh, maybe they'll be able to help me. 
and you get people who are genuine about this, who really are, are in need of help, who really want to travel with this process and, and, and get better. And then you have people who hear about this and go, that's the person I can go to to get a bit of cash from. Right? And so he says, don't tell anyone. I don't need more gossip hanging around about how I'm the guy that everyone can come to to just suck me dry. I've got enough people following me around. There's enough people to heal. And he, he's far more interested in the people who are going to accept the healing and have faith in him and far less interested in the people who are just there looking for a handout. Because he wants people to receive, people to be healed, to live in a way of hell and not just take something. He travels past the immediate situation with these people who will receive him. It's an incredibly hard place to be when we have something to give. And we can tire ourselves out easily by overdoing it, seemingly like we, we aren't getting anywhere. We say, I've helped this person and that person and so and so, and it seems like nothing's happened in their life. They just keep coming back. They keep having struggles. They keep having problems. And it can be tiring, and it can be frustrating. And these people begin to hang around us more, not because they like us, but because they like our pocketbook. But that is also married with the fact that we are to give. And we should give generously. However, we need to be selective with our generosity. We want to help people who will be healed. Not those who simply want to take something over and over and over again, because that doesn't really help them. It encourages them to stay where they are now and to continue to take. But the big question is, how do we know this? How do we know so-and-so actually has a good heart and a good attitude and wants to get better? And how do we know this other guy just wants to take? Well, some of that comes from experience. Some of that, as we travel with someone, we discover that they're just wanting to take and not to receive. But sometimes we never know. And I think every situation we get into, we need to be incredibly open to what God has to say to us. To how the Holy Spirit might lead us in a certain way with this person. That God, should I give to this person or not? And if so, how much and how and, and what, what process should I use that would best bring healing to them? If we look back at the early church, we'll turn to 2 Corinthians now. Um, they lived in a way where they would give generously and they would trust a certain process of leading of the Holy Spirit. They had people in positions who would be in charge of receiving the funds uh, of all of the churches around. And then they would redistribute those funds to all of the people. And they trusted that process. They didn't ne it necessarily wasn't about the people who were doing this process, but it was about the Holy Spirit guiding and leading. Knowing that if I give this money to the church, God will do with it what he wills. It might come back to me because I need it the most. It might go to this other guy because he needs it more than me. Because if we don't have some kind of process or some kind of direction, we can easily think about ourselves first, right? And think, well, I don't have anything to give. I need to take care of myself first so I can't. And then we feel like we can give, we do. And this, wasn't, this was something that they, they elected to do. This wasn't something that was required. The apostles didn't come in and say, you have to give us every red cent you have, and then you'll get back the portion that is allotted to you. That's not the way they did it. But instead, they gave generously out of their own hearts, knowing that the apostles would redistribute these, what, this wealth according to the direction of the Spirit. And some gave more than others. Some did it with a glad heart. 2 Corinthians 8, we'll start at verse 7. This kind of gives us context to where Paul is going here. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian church. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own, 
they ur urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service on the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave uh, themselves first of all to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. And so we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made uh, uh, a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace in your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in the love that we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So he's talking to the church in Corinth and giving a case study of the church he's just been at, this church in Macedonia. Because they didn't have anything to give. We came, we didn't expect them to give anything. We were just there to visit them, to maybe to, to give something to them out of this grand pool that, that we have to distribute according to the will of the Holy Spirit. But instead, they came and they said, we can't have a privilege to give because we know how much God has given us. And isn't that the case when you're in a situation, a person who truly is thankful, no matter how much they have, whether it be good, whether it be not good, they look and they say, God, you give me so much, and I want it back to you. And it says, we didn't tell them they needed to. It says they, it was entirely on their own volition they did this. But they wanted to. And they had they counted it a privilege to share. We all have something to give. We can choose to live our life generously or selfishly. And selfishness is not only looking out for me, but looking out for me before looking out for someone else. Looking out for me is important. But it should never come first. It's easy to give out of our excess and then not give when we feel like we don't have excess. But what do we consider our excess? What do we feel like we can live without? See, this gets incredibly personal because we deal with situations all the time where we find someone who is in a situation who we feel they really need help and we help them and it turns out that they actually did need help. Or maybe we're actually in worse straits than they were. Or maybe they were just looking for something and, and they were sort of abusing our generosity and we feel cheated in that way. Because we've given them something that we very well could have needed for ourselves to live, to sustain our life, and now they have it and they're not giving respect to that. We think of the scene with the woman who spent all that she had in these positions and, and they didn't help her. They just kept taking. This is the situation she was in. And this is why being attentive to the Spirit is important, and it will necess necessarily lead us out of a selfish attitude and into one of generosity. Because the spirit that we listen to, the spirit that is in us, is one of generosity. Verse 8, of or verse 7 in Corinthians, talks about this spirit or this attitude and it says, um, you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and uttermost eagerness and in our love for you. So we want you to excel in this generous undertaking. And verse 8, I do not say this as a commandment, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the eagerness of others. For we know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He says this is the attitude of Christ. This is the attitude of the spirit that is in you. Attitude of generosity. And how often does it happen that God has given generously to someone and they don't receive it? They just take it, right? How many people have you heard who maybe come to church or they receive Christ or whatever a language you want to use and then they say well it just didn't work for me right or uh, uh, god didn't do this thing that i thought he should have done so i've left the church or you you hear about the thing uh, you know a license to sin 
that someone's received the grace of God, and then they go and they do whatever they feel like, and they get into trouble because, well, God's going to forgive me. Abusing this grace. And if we feel that way when we give something to someone else, how do we think God feels? When he gives something so precious to us and we say, I don't want to receive your trajectory, your way of living. I just instead want to take a nugget here along the way and see what you can do. It doesn't stop God from being generous with his grace. But at the same time, we don't receive it because we are not willing to live in that space. So we should give generously, but give generously according to our means. Not give what we don't have, but also not keep everything for ourselves for fear that that person we give to might abuse our gifts. There's a chance they might, so I'm not going to try. Jesus gave both exclusively and inclusively. I think it was uh, Bruxy Cavey who said that, that Christianity is both the most inclusive and exclusive religion that exists. Because the grace of God is so inclusive, everyone can have it, but it's incredibly exclusive because only a select few actually receive. Only those who are willing to receive Christ actually do. So we should give in a way that is so inclusive, everyone can have what we have to give them. And yet at the same time, be smart about it and give in a way that is also exclusive. That only those who are willing to receive what we have to give them will actually receive it. To close off, we'll read the rest of the section here, verse 10. It says, In this manner I'm not, I am giving my advice. It's appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, uh, but even to desire to do something, and now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order, there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who has much did not have too much, and the one who has little did not have too little. So do you have much or do you have little? Do you sometimes feel tired of giving? I think we need to give generously, and yet still give smartly. Let the Holy Spirit guide us, knowing that this is our desire, to give and to receive, to live in a way that we have something so much more to give someone. You think about the story of the woman at the well where she needs or, or water, and he's talking about this water that's not going to quench your thirst forever. I have something far greater to give. I can give you this thing now, and you can take that, and you can run, and you can do what you will with it, but there's so much more I can give you. And I think when we give to people, we're not just giving a physical thing, but we want to let them receive it. Because the reason why we are where we are, regardless of our... Uh, status in the, in the, uh, po on the poverty line or above it or way beyond it or wherever we are, the reason why we're there is because of God, right? I mean, we come here on Sunday morning, we thank God for the incredible things he does in our life. And it's that attitude, that continual occurring attitude that keeps us in that space of realization of what God has done. And that's the place we want people to get. To realize no matter where you are, no matter what you have, you have something because of God. And some people will receive that, and some people won't. 
some people, when we talk to them about God or about religion or about anything like that, all of a sudden they shut down. And that might be an indicator that maybe they're not willing to actually receive what they should be receiving. Sometimes it will chase people away. And sometimes it's easy to think, well, then maybe I should have waited and not said something. And, you know, given them some things first and then talked about Jesus. And that can be effective depending on their hearts. Again, this isn't the, this is the only way to do it sort of uh, formula. But I think more often than not, at least speaking about Jesus and letting them be aware of the reason why you're giving it is a good place to start. To know that, that just give a, an inkling in their mind, there's so much more I could give you if only you, you would receive. And journey with someone in that way. I hope that can encourage us. I hope that can uh, sort of um, be a way that we can respond well when we find people who are in situations that we can both give generously and also give smartly. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll have a time for questions.